Dang. Welcome to Biz Talk on Ta On with myself, Fazlin, and my co-host Adi Ismail, where we will be talking and getting involved in discussions with business owners here in Singapore and around the region to learn from them their challenges and how they overcame those challenges. And we want to pick their brains for ideas and tips in order to use them to benefit our own businesses as well. So if you're listening to us through podcasts, welcome. And if you're watching via Facebook Live telecast, let's roll in the intro. Hi. Hi there. All right. So welcome back to part two of the 17th episode of Beast Talk On Ta On. All right. So... Thank you very much, guys, for tuning in to our Facebook live session right now. We have a special guest for all of you tonight. His name is Mustafa Kamal, and he is, in fact, a property investor. So he has been doing this for many years now. So I would say he has ample experience to answer any questions should you have thrown at him. Right? So we, that's exactly what we would like to encourage each and every one of you who's tuning in right now. Please, should you have any questions for Mustafa, Feel free to put all those questions in the comments right now and he will address them for you. All right. So thank you very much for staying put. <laughs> that was a quick break, isn't it? <laughs> all right. So did you, did you have your much relief? That's good. That's good. All right. So I throw in a question to you before the break and the question was pertaining to rental of property. Do you suggest homeowners to rent the entire unit or just specific rooms? Because we talk about selling and buying yep. in, uh, in part one, right? So now let's talk about rental. So do you prefer them to rent the entire unit or just specific rooms? Mustafa. Right. So the, the public perception is that when you rent out the whole house, you're going to have less problems. This is the perception okay, uh, that drives the consumer behavior, right? People will rent out the whole house because they think less problem, please, and less people I need to interact with. Um, and um, But but um, what really happens on the ground is actually quite different. Uh, yes, you've got to deal with more people. You can't change that. Um, but if you rent out rooms, you actually have more control. You have more control because what you're renting out is just that square foot of room space. And you can enter anytime, not anytime into the room, but you can enter into the common spaces. You can have a better um, monitoring process about how your property's upkeep is. Um, you can impose better rules so that they adhere to those things. You can qualify who goes in and who goes out a little bit better. Um, and the depreciating cost or the, the replacement cost is not as high because you get to solve the problems before it becomes too bad. So a lot of the horror stories that people really, there will be always the one of horror stories that you, people will say that I've got tenants from hell. Usually they are whole house rentals and where, you know, they, they trash your house or they damage your house or they, you know, they just, they just you know, you, you, you get those. But typically the problems come from whole house rentals. Um, and I mean, that notwithstanding that you get more yield, right? So we don't want to talk about money and profits all the time because that's a byproduct. But but yes, it is what it is. You get more money when you rent out rooms. <laughs> so is it correct to say that it's better to rent specific rooms rather than uh, you know rent the whole entire unit? Um, I would not make that as a being too prescriptive that everybody should do it because it mm. depends on your appetite for for this. Because a lot of people feel that what if my rooms get empty? What if I rent out one room and then two rooms becomes empty? People have this. Um, these fears, and if I find that the client is too fearful of all the things, you say, okay, you, you, I think it's better for you to rent out the whole house. But if you are a little bit more open-minded and you must trust that the person that you employ to do the job has got a fantastic management system, which and they have done it before, and they dominate the market, they've got a market share, they know where to source an endless supply of tenants, even in a recession kind of uh, situation, in a COVID situation today, we can still find where the UD the catchment of tenants are and have that consistent flow. If you can have those things to mitigate your fears, then um, then you, you can consider room rental. Um, it's not for everybody, obviously, but um, yeah, the, the the cash flow is is is, is, is lucrative. Can can you give us a, an example, Mustafa? I mean, if let's say you rent out a five room HDB 
uh, the yeah. whole unit versus if you actually rent it, you know, room by room. What's the the difference in terms of returns that you can get? Okay, if, I'll, I'll yeah. talk about something that's fresh off my mind that I just did um, last week. Okay, so okay. there was a person who was was being told by a, a sales maker that uh, he should sell his house but he should sell his house at a loss uh, it's about fifty thousand loss and he says that's the way it is everybody has to suck it up and take a loss and then uh, he doesn't want to so he's got um he's got guts to say no 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 i'm, I'm not going to take the loss so he came to me and i says good you don't have to sell it um so what do you want to do he wants to move to a condominium so he i said okay so let's let's monetize your hdb right we fully pay for that and so you didn't fully pay for the hdb but it's paid by his cpf contribution so he doesn't have to top up any cash right um, so then he was at the crossroads should i rent whole house or should i do room rental so for his four room flat it's in tampanese if you rent it out you probably get one nine two thousand okay so we rent out all the rooms for him um i think he's getting about close to 2009 wow okay let's so get 2009 and with 2009 he can then rent a two-bedroom condo. He's actually renting. He got a two-bedroom condo for about two thousand or two thousand one, and he's got eight hundred dollars income. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets to move to a condo without the hassle, without having to take the loss, without having to come out with the five percent cash, and all of that process. Um, so it suits him. So it doesn't suit everybody because not everybody is is game for rental. There are certain trade-offs with renting a house. You don't feel like it's yours and stuff. But this is a young couple who stayed in their HDB for five years. I like to emphasize that you need to play, you know, play a game here because it is what it is. It's a game. You've got to play by the rules. So I'm not encouraging anybody to play outside of the boundaries of the law or whatever it is. You can't be renting out your kitchen and you can't be renting out. Um, you can't be doing like 10 rooms and renting out to workers and stuff. Don't, don't do all those unless people, you know, people do have interesting ideas. But I'm not encouraging this kind of um of practices because it, it's it's not worth it. You shouldn't be doing that. Airbnb and all this is not allowed. So we're not we're, what we're talking about is not like a short term Airbnb kind of thing. Please, uh, these are the kind of stuff that will get you into trouble. So don't you don't have to do it. You don't have to rent out for ten people to be a a shrewd investor. You don't have to do it. You can actually um, do it properly, lah. You know, do it. Don't be flaky about yeah. it. You be flaky about it, yeah. you get flaky tenants. You get flaky people. <laughs> I totally agree with you, 100%. Uh, let me just recall back what you've already mentioned. So there is this guy, a scenario that you gave us earlier, that there is this guy who owns an HDB flat, a four-bedroom HDB flat, right? So uh, you, instead of, uh, what do you call that, renting his old unit, he rented out all rooms, all four rooms. Yes. And he and he managed to gunner in, say, how much, 2009 per month? Nine, yeah. About 2009. Yeah. Ah, okay, and he managed to rent another condo unit, which is roughly about two thousand one. So he got yeah. eight hundred dollars in cash. Oh, okay, wow. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. that's and, good for him, lah. I would and, say. And, yeah. um, they they are not in a worse off position or anything like that. Uh, they are decent. Right. Um, uh, they would fall under the middle class category. I think she's a nurse, and he's um, you know, they they're comfortable, and they don't have to do anything different. They, they you know, they don't have to predicate their decision on getting like a like a race or a promotion or whatever right. it is nothing spectacular needs to happen but they're living comfortably their loan amount is is considerably manageable you know you're not taking a loan beyond your means um and i think and they don't have to pay the maintenance but they're at the pool every day and um, i mean i know it's not a motivation to <laughs> uh, to not <laughs> pay for them but yeah you don't have to pay the maintenance the landlord pays the maintenance they, he she, they, they get a good deal so these are the solutions which I, I i i'm talking about but but it needs to start from the from from the right place and that place is to actually um be open-minded that you selling your house doesn't solve the problem sometimes all right so this this needs to be an education uh, if you're talking about in respect to the community this needs to be a uh, re-education so renting all four rooms means he's having four tenants, four different tenants, um, right? I this this particular scenario, there's only one person in each room. So I, ah. typically, if you're asking me now for my advice, what kind of hmm. how do I discern between the tenant profile, and I will have an opinion on that. So I typically don't rent out to to, to couples. I don't encourage my clients to rent out to couples because couples tend to dominate spaces. Um, and then you will chase out your other tenants. So you need to be more 
uh, aware of certain certain things when you do room rental. You need to have someone who is a proper system to manage all of this, to put nationalities of people who can get along because of our experience. We're not trying to generalize certain things, but certain people can't get along as well. So you need to have, you know, it's an art actually. So you need to put people who will not, who will cause me less trouble, you know. <laughs> so, so it's I know about the, putting the right people together, right? Yeah, so we, yeah. our team has got a perfect recipe for it. We don't handle because mm-hmm. we've got thousands of tenants that we manage. So we have got a proper system. We've got a rental manager. We've got a uh, maintenance officer who handles them and handles their needs. So it's a proper system. You 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 can do it on your own, lah. I mean, if you wanna be a hobbyist about it, but. Um, you should really do it on your own. And if it doesn't work out, you can just give me a call. Okay, Nazrin had another question. He he was saying that some people view that HDB had a better rental yield as compared to condo or vice versa. So he's asking on your opinion. Uh, Mos, oh, what sure. is your view on this? For sure. The HDB has got a fantastic yield uh, because, of, because of the very simple math that the quantum is lower. So the yield is much better, more lucrative. Um, a little bit more regulations though. So just a quick example, the regulatory difference would be a condominium. I think the URA rule is that a minimum of three months lease. I think HDB, you need about six months minimum. Uh, and uh, some restrictions on work permit holders who are non-Malaysians. So you need to be more aware of this and you need to play by the rules. Um, with the condominiums, um, you kind of like got a free reign to do what you to, to do what you want. It's, it's, it's a private property. Um, be more conscious also about the your neighbors, uh, whether you are, um, you know, you've got neighbors who don't look too kindly on, on you renting the whole house out. So all these you can be aware of. Um, but the thing about a condominium and if it's a if it is a property that is high performing, um, it may not perform as high as a HDB, but there is a chance that that the prices escalate a little bit better. So if you buy a 400,000 HDB, for it to go into 800,000, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's improbable. So it falls within the improbable realm, where much harder or un- less likely to happen. But in the condominium, um, all things are possible. So you can buy something at 800,000 today, they've really got a minimum reserve price of 1.6 million already in some properties. Mm. It's supposed to go onto the collective sale motion, but because of certain factors in 2018, um, government introduced, um, I think in July 2018. So you do some measures, there's a handbrake on it, but there was already a reserve price already. So only in the private property scene do you see this opportunity of capital appreciation in um, unprecedented amounts. Like 800,000 can become 1.6 million, yeah, only private property. Uh, um, HGB can happen also, like, but obviously in, in several lifetimes. But um, <laughs> Uh, so that that is the, the the edge that a private property has, and if it is within your affordability, if you have the means to do it without overburdening your your family, without overburdening your lifestyle, if you have those means, you should actually give yourself and give your 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 family a shot. Uh, you know, give it a chance, take a chance on it. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, Adi. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are always opportunities, right, Moss and. Uh, what I understand also by talking to a few property experts is that you got to look also at the potential of a certain area, right? Like uh, whether, for example, is there going to be new developments or is there going to be like, you know, things that are going to change around that area that might, you know, be positive for that property, right? Uh, maybe is that important? Is there any, maybe you can tell us some examples of good locations where you know someone who's listening right now who has some money and wants to invest maybe you can give some tips on some of the locations that you know they can look they can look into sure i'm again my 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 opinions and my advisory is going to be a bit biased because i specialize in the east so everything from district 15 from the katong area all the way into the edge of changi that's my that's my town okay so i'm going to be a bit more biased in saying that the east is where you should park your money and you can make the argument that there are other districts which are profitable um and we can have that discussion another time but um uh, where where we look what we look at is actually land into land intensification indicators so whenever the government comes out and announces that, look, I'm going to intensify the plot ratio here. Uh, I'm going to be putting up a cross island line somewhere. I'm going to put a Thompson um, line somewhere. You need to take it seriously because you need to follow the pattern. And it's, it's, while it's a game, obviously, 
some people are good at the game, some people are just terrible at the game, they can't spot the trend. Uh, but that's that's an indication where there's capital appreciation going to be. And that's where if right. um, where the developers are going to see it like that as well. So where what I usually do is I usually um, park my money where there's an impending MRT station. This is what I did for all the properties that I bought. There's an impending train station. Um, and there's also empty parcels around the, the development because that empty parcels would actually indicate development and that's actually the uh, that's how the PSS gets stretched up because it's competitive. Whenever there is a there's an empty parcel, they will launch it at a price that will break the previous price. It's it's, it's always like that. Nobody will, will launch it at a cheaper price. So what happens is once you complete one of the POPs, it will create another price. It will hit another price benchmark. Another price frontier will break because Singaporeans want to make fifty dollars PSF pun jadi lah. They say you know, they want to make a profit. So that innate um, competitiveness, I want to sell higher, I want to sell higher, that would drag my PSF up. So mm. that's why we look at empty parcels. It's actually a good, I mean, on the surface, simply put, uh, if you don't have to get into the nitty gritty of it, if you see an empty parcel and you know that there is an impending development, go find out what the plot ratio is. Um, and you can have an, a rough sensing of, of, of the trajectory of, of the PSF growth. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's what I do. I'm staying in the East Coast area and then, trust me, there's a lot of uh, empty parcels around. And <laughs> you know what? Because furthermore, <laughs> I'm yeah. really excited because, <laughs> because there's an East Coast plan coming up. So I'm really yeah. excited. So if you guys are wondering where to put your money in, right? So East Coast is definitely the, the place where you need to park your money in. <laughs> 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 okay all right all right okay so let's let's talk about your experiences most let's talk about your experiences right uh as muslims we are very much concerned on who we rent out you know our homes to uh, what are your experience like you know with those tenants that cook pork or drink alcohol in the unit or even you know worse suspecting of taking drugs and even uh, bring along partners from the opposite gender or sex, you know, into the room and all that. So I'm sure with your ample experience, you have experienced those before. So maybe you want to share them with us then. Yeah. A bit chalat this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I'll take it nonetheless. Um, so my mom is conscious about these things. I guess she's at a phase of her life where she's always reminding me, um, look, the tenants that you're bringing, are they married? Because uh, I don't want to have that hanging over my head. My mom is very conscious of this. Uh, um, yeah, so, um, and I don't want to have that argument. Um, and, and I understand her point of view. I totally understand where where that concern comes from. Uh, you want to make it as halal as possible. You don't want to be an enabler of, 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 um, of these things. We, we understand. Um, so you can have those things um, as your search criteria. So although, you know, like a hotel runs it in a way where they don't really ask for your marriage cert each time, uh, but there's no justification for you to do the same. Uh, like, but you can have a, a very systematic um, search criteria um, that, uh, look, um, we, 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 we can't control everything, but we can control certain things. Yeah. Food-wise, with regards to, 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 to pork, um, you 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 got to be a bit more open minded on it because you're not staying there, you're not sharing those cutlery or with them. Uh, you need to be open minded about it. But uh, yeah, so I I I don't control that kind of level with my tenants. So as long as they're clean, these are, are very important criteria for me. Uh, exceptionally, yeah, I mean the concern is the concern will be what if the homeowner is staying together with the tenants? That will be an issue, isn't it? Right. So um, typically that is forms a very small percentage of my market share. Uh, most of my mm. clients are investors, uh, Singaporeans who are not in Singapore, they're overseas, so they entrust me to manage their portfolio of properties. Um, so they're not really staying with with the, the, the tenants. Uh, but if you happen to be that kind of investor where you are monetizing your, your room and you're living with that person, then for sure my, my main advice to them is that um, restrict cooking. Um, but, you know, you you can't curtail those things and you'll, you'll find it that you'll have uh, a difficulty renting it out as well. So I guess mm. that is a challenge if you're going to live with somebody. Um, yeah, so you, but we can have those kind of restrictions and all this. Uh, but I, I, I don't, this is not a big part of what I do. Okay. 
Right, right. So that goes to my next question as well. Uh, you know, some owners are concerned about harboring criminals. They even use the units and even uses the room, you know, for storing of stolen properties and stuff. Uh, will the homeowner be liable in that case by the law and be prosecuted okay. for having, um, say, for example, common intention? Yep. Okay. So you and I are from a similar background. So <laughs> we have to be um, uh, okay. So there is a due diligence process. So first of all, right. you need to get someone who has got this sensing. So from the phone call, I can pre-qualify all the red flags. I'll be able to do it because I do it every day. You see? Um, so we, we obviously look out for red flags um, uh, in the tenant pool, uh, but you can you can include certain things which will protect you inside the contract. So if anyone um, uh, breaks any local laws or is in breach of any of anything, um, you can, you must reserve the right to terminate the the contract without any penalty on, on your part. So that's mm. that's also that's people assume that is is it is it is uh, the accepted thing. People assume that is the norm. But you need someone to to see that layer of uh, of, of those terms and make sure that it's enforceable. So it's uh, it's not just about having it and assuming that it's part of the contract. So uh, not really a huge problem because if you know how to sieve out um, those good profiles of tenants, and it's what we do. We we want less problem for ourselves. So we have a knack for um, for sieving out good quality, good candidate tenants. Uh, for our investors. Yeah. Yeah, Adi? Yeah, so um, you did mention just now that the east side is of Singapore is one of the ideal areas, right? Yep. For investment, right? Uh, maybe you can qualify that statement. Why instead of maybe investing uh, in the central region of Singapore or in the north side, you know? Why mm -hmm. is the east side? What are the strong points, you know, that you, you can actually uh, explain to our audience? Oh. Yeah. So the well, obviously the the desired district is this D nine and D ten. Um, yeah. Those central districts really they are status purchase. So those folks have already made their money from other industries. They really made their money somewhere else. So their margins for er margin for error is uh, you know with a higher tolerance level. So if they were to pump in a three million purchase in D nine in the Orchard Belt, for example. And you go through a cycle like this, and they, you know, it's a half a million um, value loss, for example. Um, they can take it because they make their money somewhere else. But we, who are from real estate, and we we are built from the ground up, uh, our margin for error is very small, so we cannot afford to make a mistake. So we then try to find out districts where there's an inherent cluster or catchment of tenants that is that inherent demand where the mass market. Um, buyers are, and it was. It's almost recession proof because the district has has a certain um, um, the catchment is always there. You can't remove Changi Airport, even if Changi Airport is not functional at the moment. Some terminals are closed, but my tenants we are on hundred percent occupancy, and that's like hundreds of properties on hundreds. All of them are hundred percent occupied, so I don't think any of my ten uh, my investors would say they are on a any room is vacant. So the demand is still there, even though the airport is not functioning, but it's not going to be, it's not going to change the landscape of the East um, too much. Um, D15 is, is another status purchase um, in the East, but um, it's highly valued by certain people who are from D15. So obviously if you're from Pasir Ris or Tampanese and you look at D15 is in, uh, is in the Katong uh, um, area. Katong um, area, yeah. Katong East Coast area. Obviously, when you look at at it from um, a D17, uh, D18 perspective, it looks like it's so overpriced. Um, but folks who are living inside there and they move around in D15, that's normalized already. That's just that's just the price to pay to be in that district. Um, so, but there's still movement. People still attach a certain sense of prestige, a certain sense of uh, um, glamour. Is it? We can say so. Um, <laughs> I've got lots of time there, so I don't want to upset them. But um, uh, I can understand. Uh, I can understand the law of, of D fifteen as well. So mm, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Okay. So one uh, Shafi had another question. He's asking, "What are your thoughts about the mega condo in the east? Uh, will this be a new trend for developers?" Uh, okay. What are the mega condo in the east? I'm going to assume that he's managing treasures. 
at Tampines. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Mega 2000 units kind of condos. Uh, I, I think that's correct, Shafi? Yeah, Shafi, maybe you want to clarify uh, exactly which condo you're, you're, you're referring to? I Mega think that will help in our discussion. Yeah. Yeah, Moose, you can continue. Okay. So I, I think that's what he means. Uh, condominiums mm. with, with, with massive number of units there. Um, yep. Well, what that translates in simple terms to me is that you've got 1,900 competitors. When you exit the market, you're going to compete with them. So if you're looking at it from an investment standpoint, when you when it TOPs, you're going to be fighting out with all these hundreds of people who are also going to be renting out at the same time. Now, when that happens, when there's an oversupply, the price will drop. So part of the, the, the strategy of an investor is to, to suffocate the supply. So whenever there's not much movement, you can suffocate the supply. And that's where you can drive the price up. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the the basic economics of it. So whenever there's too much competition, not really a fan. But but um, but you know, the, 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 there's always a textbook argument for 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 those condos. It's brand new, it's in the heart of Tampines, it's mature estate, the PSFs are still affordable compared to this and that. There's a textbook argument for it. And you've got very influential salespeople who you know, people are starstruck by a lot of things. They'll listen to whoever that says whatever. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that you need to be a bit more discerning in the advice, uh, the advisory that's coming in. Um, and ask back the simple question, would you put your money where your mouth is? You know, are you going mm. to do it together with me? If, if I ask you to do something, have I done so myself? That, that's a good indication of, of, of qualifying that advice, that it comes from the right place. Uh, I'm not perfect, but... Um, I, I'm always honest in my advice. I think RD will be able to tell you that I, I, I wouldn't ask my clients, people who supported me from the beginning, um, people who believed in, 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 in our vision. I've never asked them to do something I've not done myself. Uh, Moss, have, have, uh, yeah, I, I, I have actually spoke to Moss about uh, property investing and all that. So the ideas that he has actually given, I would say are very unique. And uh, I think it's important if you want to become an investor, right? Basically, you got to really study the area where you're going to invest in. And if you invest in something with uh, with a lot of demand for rental, and there's not many supply in that area, definitely you're going to have an edge, right? Uh, I'm doing trading and investing myself in financial markets, also in property, and uh, I that concept is very important. You know, uh, when you know you have something which is in great demand, definitely the prices, you are the one who can set it and you can actually benefit from it. And that's that's very important. And uh, yeah, so mega condos in the East, are, in my opinion, are great. It allows you to enter at a lower price point. But uh, but when you actually, when it's TOPs, basically a lot of people, if they want to sell, then it's going to be very competitive. That's That, yeah. that I can agree with, uh, with most because, yeah, my own experience uh, also, you know, uh, investing in property, and I, I can uh, attest to that. So, while we're on the topic of demand and supply, um, I, I took economics in, in, in JC. I, I, I got a B, la. I'm not an A student, but I got a B in economics. So, just, just my two cents worth while we're on that topic. Um, it also applies to when you appoint a salesperson to market your property. He needs to be a strategist. And if you, if you employ, let's say, for example, 10 salesperson to market one house. Um, some sellers feel that that is a strategy to get them to compete and then people can source buyers from different parts of the world maybe and then drive up my price. That's the perception. I get more people working for me, I can drive up my prices. But what's happening in reality is that you are actually creating an artificial supply. It's one property but to the buyer, it looks like 10 properties. You are actually saturating it, making it there's more supply of just that one and what happens is people compete and the weakest link there of that that group of people who are selling marketing the property the weakest link will drive the price down so that's that's actually a classic case in point where you need to trust it doesn't have to be me like, it can be anybody but um, you have to trust the person that you pick he's going to suffocate the supply restrict the supply and then drive the price up the same way the 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 beers company are managing diamonds. I mean, that's a different conversation for another day, but they, they, they restrict the supply and it creates a perce perception of value it's way higher than what it, it's worth. So the same thing. Right. So yeah, we, we, we have to restrict the supply 
and and um, create that mystery about about that just one property. Can you go through one agent and only one person holds that key to that property? And it, it drives the price up. That's a key strategy there. All right. Okay. Okay. Anyway, uh, we got one more question. One last question before we end the session. Sure. Let me see. It's another question from Nazrin. Yep. So there you go. He's asking with this COVID-19, what are the thoughts on the rental tenancy in the next one or two years? Yeah. Right. That's a fair question. It's a very relevant question. But uh, if I may say this, most of our systems and our operations are recession proof because this is a good example where our rental demand is, uh, is, is our rental properties are oversubscribed. So this, this, it's not enough rooms actually, not enough places to rent. Um, people will argue that that's not the case. People could say that um, they've been faced with um, with, with um, vacancies and we need to qualify the question a little bit more. So if you're looking at the commercial scene, I have many um, folks who actually, if they're fully paid for their, um, their uh, restaurant or commercial uh, space and um, it, it, it gets, uh, it's quite terrible. Uh, they've not been getting full rents for the past uh, I think since March, they've been on half rent, half rent, and um, I think beyond August, they might just pull out. So those commercial properties are really taking a hard hit. Um, so in the next one to two years, obviously, anything can happen, but I think the commercial sector is hit very hard. Um, the the residential holdout sector, there's still sufficient demand, but the room rental sector is oversubscribed. It's, it's, you have no idea how hot it is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, the basic thing that people need to stay somewhere, right? <laughs> no matter what happens, whether they are working or not working, they're working from home, they still need that basic room uh, to sleep in. Somebody needs to stay somewhere. Yeah, true. I totally agree on that. But yeah, Adi, any last yeah, question uh, from, from you? Yeah, there's one question I want to ask. If, let's say, you know, uh, someone has like a uh, 100,000 to invest in, but, you know, that is not enough to actually buy into an investment property. Uh, are there any ways actually, if let's say that that individual can call on his family members, friends or other partners that want to invest in a property and they, can, they could actually come together to explore buying a unit for investment? Maybe most you can share with us on, yeah. on strategies. Yeah, so I, I handle a lot of these actually where people feel that on their own, um, either it could affect their to buy, to seize an opportunity whenever it's a good deal um, and you, it's presented to you and you can make the argument not to buy the house and it could be based on your affordability or your fear. It, it, is, it is a big purchase. So if I were to tell you, look, there's a $2 million property that's really significantly undervalued. It's actually valued at $3 mil, but the guy is willing to let go at $2 million. It's fantastic. Can you please seize it? If not, I'm going to seize it. Um, but then to him, it's $2 million, bucks, man. I've never bought anything um, beyond... 50,000, so asking someone to buy 2 million, it will scare his pants off. But that's where you can come together. Certain people have um, have a CPF, uh, the CPF strong. They may have three, 400,000 in CPF. They're not married for any particular reason. Um, and it's a family member maybe. And then somebody is cash strong, somebody can take up the loan. And there's nothing wrong to get them together to seize the opportunity in the short term. You can rent it out. You don't have to live there together. <laughs> Uh, but you can structure the property ownership under tenants in common. Um, so this tenancy in common, what happens is that it's got nothing to do with tenants. Huh? It's just the way of manner of holding. Um, it's, it works a bit differently from joint tenants uh, in the sense that if something happens to one of the investors, it doesn't go to the surviving um, uh, owners. So whoever is part of that uh, ownership, it doesn't go to him. It will go to your estate. So if let's say the three of us were to come together and seize an opportunity, obviously there must be a deal to seize. Like if there isn't a good opportunity, you shouldn't go through all the kerfuffle of doing it. Um, but uh, what happens if something happens to me, it goes to my estate. My estate will then take over that, that ownership. My estate will be made out of my beneficiaries uh, distributed according to Farayit. So that's a more um, investment um, safe approach. Uh, people can do that, and we have got many cases of people doing it. It's 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 it's, it's tried and tested. Um, it works almost like a Kongsi kind of um, uh, synergy, you know. Right. And then you have a clear exit strategy to prevent somebody from being too greedy. Because sometimes it happens, family or not family. Um, you have the problem arises when you want to exit 
says nothing is good enough for some people. So if you bought it at um, um, 750,000, for example, you need to clearly demarcate what your exit strategy is. Look, 200,000 profit, take and run, take and go. You know, um, but there will always be someone who feels that, hey, you know, it's not enough. Uh, 150,000, 110,000. So you've got to clearly demarcate what your exit strategy is. Get them to pre-sign the option if possible um, so nobody can back out. If you make 200,000, take it. You know, you don't have to be too greedy about it. It's, it's money either way. Yeah. Uh, what, what happens if, let's say, one of the partners, right, uh, yeah. basically lost his job and he couldn't pay the mortgage, you know? So what happens in, in that kind of situation? Yeah, so now those kind of investments, they are set up usually um, for rental. So the mortgage usually is paid from the rental. So your tenants are paying your mortgage. Um, uh, so in essence, there's a layer of security. And sometimes people do room rentals. There's a buffer. There's an added buffer um, exactly to write you uh, to tide you past um, this kind of situation. But usually people are, being, are paying it from their CPF as well. So the mortgage is paid from two folks' CPF. So whatever cash that you get from your rental is, is pure cash. And then I guess you can save those cash. If it's 3000 to 4000 a month, across one year, that's already $48,000. So you should set aside some kind of buffer. If one person gets uh, uh, retrenched and then um, then the, his TPF contribution is not enough, right? To make for the shortfall. Mm -hmm. so you need to top up. So that, that, that 48000 a year should be more than more than sufficient to, 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 to make up for those shortfall. If someone gets... Um, retrenched, for example. Um, so it, it works if you're going to rent it out for sure. Um, and, and, and yeah. Okay, then thank you for answering the question, Mas. Yeah, we've, uh, it seems that, you know, we, we've come to the end of the episode, right? We've already spent, say, like, what, one hour and a half. Oh, right. Yeah. So I really appreciate it, Mo. So how can, you know, the viewers and our listeners contact you then? Right. Um, well, I, I write a, a, a simple blog. So I've got unlockedpropertysecrets.com. I try to write my thoughts there. It should be, it should be, um, it should be sufficient read. I think I, sh I owe it to myself to to, to write more uh, on that blog. So you, if, if it's not too heavy for you, then you should do it. But if reading is not uh, your cup of tea, you want to meet me in person, then you can always give me a call. I, I'm I'm always uh, open for a chat. Um, keep. An open mind for it. Uh, you might not like you might not like everything I have to say, but I'm open and I'm I'm transparent about my thoughts, and I've got a I've got something to offer, um, uh, and I, I think I can add value to your to your to your property plan. Um, so you can call me at eight triple six one triple five. It's it's it's, uh, it's easy number to remember eight six 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 one five five five. Right. Eight six 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 one five five five. Five five five. Very nice number, anyway. Yeah, it's really easy that. to remember. Yeah. So again, I would like to say thanks for having me here. I think it's uh, more than anything else. I think I enjoyed myself talking to the two of you, uh, bouncing off uh, ideas, and I think our con conversation may will be will be helpful. Uh, we need this kind of courageous conversations uh, within the community because at the end of the day, it's not about uh, you owe it to yourself to share um, because these strategies can be duplicated. It's not just for one person to hoard. Uh, we are better and we are strongest when we do things together and we can benefit right. from a um, and uplift each other and uh, and uh, circulate the funds in a more uh, positive way because when you enrich one another we both succeed together that's that's the spirit that is so true that is so true i totally agree with you yep thank you very much Mos. we really appreciate you coming into the show you know sharing your thoughts sharing your tips and advices, I think these are valuable, valuable advices. And, and I think our viewers and our listeners would benefit very greatly from that. Thank you very much. I really yeah. appreciate it. It's Thank nice you, Mark. Thanks for having me, man. All right, so, no worries, man. So to all our listeners and our viewers right now, so like say, for example, Nazrin, he even, you know, sat all the way till the end just to watch this. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, Shafi Ibrahim, yeah, he, likewise, he, he's saying thanks, guys, for tonight, yeah. Thank you very much. You know, right, Adi, we, we really appreciate them staying all the way up to the end just, just to <laughs> just to watch this. It's really, really you know, very, yeah. very appreciative of it. Yeah. yeah. Correct. It's really encouraging Correct. that uh, to know that our audience have benefited from uh, our shows. Mm. We intend mm. to actually get, you know, intend to get more people coming on board, people like Moss who have uh, done it, you know, did it and, you know, is willing to share. And not just you know keep his uh, secrets to himself. <laughs> so I guess if you are looking into buying a property for investment, 
or if you intend to upgrade, you know, give Moss a call and uh, just listen to him because I myself have done it. I even brought my wife later on to listen to him. And uh, yeah, you might just learn a thing or two and, you know, maybe get into a good property investment. Yep, correct, correct. So if you guys need to contact uh, Moss, you can always right here, right here, right here. If you can see my finger, right here, I'm pointing to the QR code. You can always scan the QR code. Or you can always call him at his number at 866-61555, right? And yep, thank you very much. Have a great Sunday, Moss. Let's catch up one of these days again, yeah? All right. So good start uh, to the coming week, man. I'll see you guys soon. Yep. Yep. Take care, buddy. Take care. Bye. See you guys. Take care. Bye. Okay. So, Adi, what do you think? Yes, Fazlin. Uh, we have come to the end of another good show. I hope that uh, all the audience out there have benefited from listening to the discussion we had with Moss. And uh, I personally have actually learned uh, a bit, uh, quite a number of things actually on, you know, before I, if I even have the money to invest in the next property. <laughs> but I'm sure if you have the you money have, to invest, I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do, buddy. You have deeper pockets than anyone else down here. <laughs> Thanks for the doha, buddy. No problem. I'll make another doha for you. So I'm looking forward for you to your next bungalow, inshallah. <laughs> okay, so so before we go, I'm sure we have some announcement. Uh, Adi, maybe you want to say uh, the announcement from Flitzer Performance before we go? Yep. If uh, Okay, this is an announcement from FlitzerPerformance.com. Basically, Flitzer Performance provides and supplies products that uh, will enhance the performance of your car if you are driving, you know, if you are driving basically a Mercedes or BMW or even if you are driving a Honda Civic or a Renault or whatever make of cars. And if you're looking to actually improve the performance of a car through LTA approved products like pedal box, rims and tires from Falcon and Gram Lights, Vogue Racing and many other parts, or you want to actually improve the interior of your car by having it uh, uh, covered with uh, carbon fiber parts, yep, you can go to Flitzer Performance website, uh, flitzerperformance.com and also their Facebook fan page. And yeah, basically uh, they have a 5% discount on most of the products that are on sale. So head over to their fan page or website and contact them. Thank you. Yep, you definitely need to contact <laughs> them. 5% discount, uh, don't play play. That's quite a lot, yeah? Do you guys do tuning as well? Uh, ECU tuning, yes, definitely. You want to actually yep. bring your car to phase one. If you want to do it to, to go to phase two, we need to go offline <laughs> to discuss ah, okay. on that. <laughs> right, so they go all the way until stage three. So they do stage one, stage two, they can even do, do stage three. No problem, stage isn't it? Stage only for you, Faslin. <laughs> oh, how many horsepower like that? 1,000 horsepower can reach. No? <laughs> okay, all right. So there's another announcement by another another one of our sponsors. Uh, this one I have to read. Lah, huh? Okay, so but before I read the announcement, uh, maybe I'll show a short video for you guys. right? So do enjoy. Right. So Mega Express International Private Limited, right? Mega Express International Private Limited is an exhibition organizer of many wedding fairs and halal food exhibition at Singapore Expo for the past 22 years. And Mega Express International will be organizing Singapore's first virtual wedding exhibition targeting the Malay Muslim community right at the end of this month from the 28th to the 30th of August. Right, It will run for three consecutive days. There will be many interesting activities and programs, including Zoom sessions between wedding vendors and wedding couples, right? And these business matching sessions will encourage dealings and bookings to be made via online. Yeah, there will be many other uh, programs to look forward to, in, uh, including live forums, webinars, and performances by celebrities and artists, including one of those that we have interviewed before, Mang. All right, so... For couples who are tying up their wedding knots really, really soon, you definitely want to visit www.megawedding.sg to choose your preferred wedding vendors and Mega Express will link you up together via online Zoom sessions. All right? So I did mention right from the start that there is a promotion by one of the participants in megawedding.sg and that is by Fast Perfume. Right? It is a brand 
from a company known as Millennial Marketing Services Private Limited. And here's a promotional offer from them, right? So the promotion is called the Solemnization Package. It's called the Solemnization Package. And they offered 6ml roll-on uh, perfume only at Singapore 125, only at $125 for 50 bottles. So that is their current promotion. 50 bottles for only Singapore dollars 125 for a 6 ml roll on perfume f as your wedding gifts and favors. So, something that you guys need to look into. Okay, then. All right. So, Adi, it seems that uh, we've really come to the end of the show. Let's look forward to the next one then. All right. Uh, what do we have next week? Um, I think it's best you let us know, Fazlin, because I think you did mention that we're going into manufacturing episodes. Correct. Correct. Okay. <laughs> All right. Maybe I can just elaborate on that. So we have really come to the end of the Realty Month. That means we have really interviewed four property agents, right? I think we, we spoke to... Uh, we spoke to Zamri Max from ERA. We spoke to Untong Shahlan Ada from Propnex. Then uh, we invited Mr. Shamir Wahid from Dane Advisory. He, he spoke about mortgage, right? Uh, mortgage issues and stuff. And today, tonight, we spoke to Mr. Mustafa, and he was he's himself is a property investor. So four weeks, four or four weeks running for our Realty Month in August. So we have already reached to the end of that. And next week, next week on Sunday, same timing as well, right? we will be talking to a manufacturer. We'll be talking to food manufacturers, that is. So, and you know, them being food manufacturers, and I'm sure they themselves would have their own uh, stories to tell so and that is something that I would definitely want to look forward to right? and I'm, I'm sure we're going to bring in something different also right for, for that program next week so I'm looking forward to seeing you guys again yep Adi me too I'm looking forward as well to hearing what our food manufacturers are up to I'm sure there's new technologies that they would like to share about new food products new items that would excite you know our consumers out there and uh, I hope to see you all next week right Fazlin with our dear yeah, host Fazlin as, as well right everyone is always looking forward to you Fazlin yeah, thank you very much it's always been a pleasure and it's always been a, my utmost pleasure to work with you lah, Adi thank you very much I really appreciate it Adi alright so let's look forward to next thank you thank you very much Adi let's look forward to the next week then I'm looking forward to seeing you guys again next week so guys stay safe and take care